Bom dia, é um prazer ter vocês aqui. E, principalmente, meu nome é Paulo Saldiva, eu sou médico, mas, por incrível que pareça, estou dirigindo o Instituto de Estudos Avançados durante esse último período. E nós tivemos aqui é, a questão de um ano e meio já, a presença da Mary Gazala como sabática. E ela trouxe para nós uma temática extremamente importante, que é a relação, é, das, é, é uma mistura entre antropologia marítima, mais ou menos, ou costeira, a relação entre as comunidades que vivem é, na beira dos oceanos, dependem dos oceanos para viver, e como elas são ameaçadas, ou, digamos, qual vai ser o desafio para as comunidades é, em frente a... a as, as mudanças de clima. E isso foi novo, nunca tinha sido feito no IA, foi muito gratificante, talvez seja foi uma das mais bem-sucedidas é, iniciativas que nós tivemos aqui dentro. E vem se somar ao grupo de cidades que estuda o mesmo aspecto, vendo o que vai acontecer com as pessoas nas ilhas de calor, nos desastres. Se soma agora a vinda do professor Carlos Nobre, que tem trabalhado com é, também no IA com uma parte de clima. E, enfim, existe um, uma, um esforço para que a gente participe e produza conhecimento local. Local e, e digamos, fazer um certo downscaling para o país e, e começar a tentar é, chegar nos remédios, né? e não só nos é, diagnósticos. Bom, a gente tem a oportunidade de ter dois pesquisadores estrangeiros que vieram generosamente emprestar seu conhecimento, compartilhar. Né? É interessante isso, né? porque numa sociedade onde tudo é precificado e você troca uma coisa por outra, conhecimento é interessante. Você compartilha, o outro sai com o seu conhecimento e você não fica sem. Então, isso aqui é um common, não uma commodity. Nós estamos vendo uma troca de um common muito importante para o planeta e agradeço, I would like to thank you very much for your presence. I'm mentioning that you are providing us with your knowledge as a common, not a commodity, because you give the knowledge for us and you remain with your own college. So, it's, it's, so this, it's, this type of exchange is, uh, indicates that commons are the basis for the future. Uh, a água é um common. O ar é um comum. É, eu, na minha opinião, até conhecimento médico é um comum. Não devia ser uma commodity. E nós estamos discutindo aqui commons. Um planeta comum. Um ambiente comum. E quem vem para fazer isso também é, não, é uncommon. As pessoas que vêm se dedicar a isso, elas têm uma pegada diferente. A gente preocupada é, que liga o pau de selfie... É, a, a câmara de selfie para fora, não para se enxergar. E isso é raro. Eu agradeço muito a presença de vocês. Muito obrigado. Eu vou deixar vocês com, uma pessoa, com pessoas mais sabidas que eu, mas eu fiz questão de vir aqui abrir pela importância do tema. Muito obrigado, Dr. Paulo Saldiva. Para nós é uma, uma honra né, estarmos aqui, termos a sua presença nessa abertura. É... I'm starting for a few words in, in Portuguese before we start. O seminário ele tá, vai ser em inglês, né? Esse evento vai ser uh, todo uh, em inglês, mas a gente vai tentar fazer algumas alguns comentários, algumas pequenas intervenções em português, né? Quando necessário. Um, tem algumas observações para vocês que esse evento ele é transmitido. Estamos uh, transmitindo ao vivo. Né, gravando, perguntas que vocês tenham para fazer para é, este evento. Vocês podem fazer diretamente aqui ao microfone. A pessoa precisa se identificar né, primeiro. E a gente pede para vocês colocarem os celulares no modo silencioso. É, para o público que está é, assistindo remotamente, bom dia também, pedimos que vocês... Se tiverem perguntas, enviem ao uh, IEA, ao e-mail, né? tudo por e-mail, e-mail IEA responde, arroba, tá? 
e mais ou menos aproximadamente uns 10 dias, essas, esse vídeo e algumas fotos do evento, elas estarão disponíveis na mediateca do IEA. Tá certo? Acho que a gente pode começar. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank very much uh, the president of these two brilliant scientists. For me, it's really a, a great pleasure to have you both here, especially because we are coming from a week, very intense week, before this one, uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, in a workshop on, on climate change, and uh, those professionals were really very busy there, and they really agreed to come here to have this uh, important talk in Sao Paulo. So first of all, thank you very much you both, and thank you for the Institute of Advanced Studies of the University Oh, uh, the, uh, you the, the, and for the people that are remotely online. Okay. Um, I have a, a couple of slides to start with to, to, to just to give an idea of the context. Vocês podem ajudar aqui a abrir o... Acho que... Deixa ele, ele abrir mesmo. Presentation before yours, sorry, because I'll, I'll put some context on that. É o meu, tá primeiro. As well, he's introducing. I, I'm gonna uh, present the two uh, exposers here. First of all, Dr. Marion Gellin on my right side. Uh, Marion Gellin is a marine bio biogeochemist with 25 years of experience, a PhD in earth sciences by the Free University of Brussels and habilitation uh, from University Pierre Marie Curie. She is a research director of Laboratoire des Sciences du Climat et de l'Environnement uh, in, in France and focusing on modeling the Earth's response to multiple anthropogenic interactions and dynamics. She's the lead scientist of major large projects targeting marine carbon cycle and ocean acidification. And she is also co-chair of the Ocean View Test Team on Marine Ecosystem Analysis and Predictions, and actively promoting dialogue between scientists and end users. Uh, in my left, we have uh, Dr. William Chong. He's Associate Professor in the Institute of, for the Oceans and Fisheries of the University of British Columbia, and Director of Science of the Nippon Foundation NEREOS program. He is internationally recognized expert in the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems and fisheries, being a lead author for the IPCC first assessment and coordinating author for the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in the changing climate. Okay. Uh, he has been published a lot of interesting articles in very impact journals and also has a large prize of excellent award of the ICES, which is the uh, International Council for the Exploration of the Seas, uh, I think last year, right? From the last year. So, um, having said that, um, I want first of all to introduce why we have these important scientists here today to talk on this, uh, what here we call advanced uh, sciences, right? Uh, so the context, maybe Marion, if you can change just for, for this couple of slides before we start. Just for you to know the context of this, this invitation. And this was part, as Dr. Saldiva said, it was part of a project here at, at the Institute. And uh, this project in Portuguese is, I will read in Portuguese, é o futuro das sociedades dependentes do mar, mudanças climáticas, desigualdades e cooperação em sistemas socioecológicos complexos. Um, now changing to English. Uh, so why complexity? Uh, what is happening with these uh, changing oceans and 
what this impacts the society who lives on them is really complex. We have complexity on that. And the science that are studying this is also really complex, dealing from global models to local studies with uh, local people, including um, coastal communities. And it, uh, it is, um, as the, the oceans are changing rapidly, they are impacting these communities and these economies living from the ocean. So this kind of interconnect interconnectedness uh, we can show from, for instance, numerical models. This is a courtesy from here, from local studies here at the university. Uh, just for illustrate for you this kind of connectedness among the oceans and the processes uh, with um, atmosphere, oceans, and uh, fish resources, fisheries, and people. And in this project here at IAUSP, we were also engaged in this project called GALS from the Belmont Forum. We were studying these kind of things in, in some countries. And we, we are also using some kind of uh, uh, models to look at the things. But the, the models that we use there are quite different from the models that uh, you are showing today. So this is why this uh, event here is very important for us to have this complementarity of ideas. Uh, and this, during this period here at the Institute, we had the opportunity to have uh, contributions in many other uh, conferences and talks. For instance, that one that FIO organized in, on adaptation on fisheries and aquaculture. And during this, this project, it would also have contribution from a thematic issue in enhancing the stewardship in Latin American and Caribbean small-scale fisheries. And it was also done during this project, inside this project. So just to mention the, the, the products that we had in this, uh, uh, this project. So this is the first of the seminar series that, came, that are coming from this project. And we also will have uh, three more. The next one will be the climate change and fishing communities, inequalities and the blue economy, and cooperation and sustainable development goals. So please, uh, you are all invited to come to the next uh, seminars here on, the, on this project. And we expect that we have some Portuguese-speaking uh, um, contributions as well. Okay, so today, advanced science, uh, what here do we mean on advanced? Yeah? And what do these global models and the complexity on the interactions can tell us about the future? So why should we care about the future? I think that this will be an important aspect that uh, my colleagues will, will explore here. Okay, so we can start by Dr. Marion Gellum from IPSL France. So good morning um, to those present and those following remotely. And first of all, thank you very much uh, to Mary for having invited me and giving me the opportunity to present part of my work here in such an interesting and challenging context and project. So the first talk, I will talk about the management of marine living resources and focus on short-term forecasts and seasonal predictions within that management framework. But to start out, I would like to go back, give some introductory information on the ocean's role in global climate change. So from the IPCC report, we learned that the ocean warming dominates the increase in energy stored in the climate system, and the ocean has taken up about 90% of the energy that accumulated in the system between um, 1971 and... No, and uh, 2010, you see this here, the ocean being the main accumulator as opposed to melting sea ice, continents, and the atmosphere. 
Similarly, the ocean has absorbed a large amount of anthropogenic CO2. Actually, if we go back to the emissions uh, since uh, 1750, emissions from fossil fuel burning, cement production, and land use change, we can evaluate that the ocean took up 30% of that anthropogenic carbon emission. So anthropogenic carbon is the excess carbon emitted by mankind's activity to the atmosphere. So the ocean absorbs heat and anthropogenic carbon, so it mitigates global climate change. But this service comes at a cost for marine ecosystems. So if you look at what happens in the past, so the historic period, as it calls in IPCC, the period that we are living now, we can see that the ocean has warmed between 0.6 and 0.8 degrees since 1900. On the right panel you see, I don't know why this doesn't work, you see the evolution of the uh, thermal content of the surface ocean. You see the clear increase, particular since 1980 here. Similarly, the ocean, the surface ocean water, their pH has dropped by 0.1 units again since the outstart of the Industrial Revolution. 0.1 pH unit amounts to an increase by 26% of hydrogen ion uh, in the water. You see this in this plot here, where on the this curve here shows the increase in PCO2 in the ocean, which is mirrored by a decrease in pH in the surface ocean. So already now, the climate change has profoundly modified physical, chemical, and probably also biological properties of the ocean. And we expect that the future changes are even more severe. So we are facing, we are moving towards a completely different ocean environment. But now what do we need to do climate projections? At one side, we need, of course, greenhouse gas emission scenarios, which are coming from integrated assessment models, as shown on this panel here. The red curve shows a high emission scenario and the blue one a high attenuation, keeping the global temperature increase below two degrees, uh, below, below two degrees Celsius. So the blue curve is something that would correspond to the implementation of the Paris Agreement. What you see here is that you we need an active removal of CO2 from the atmosphere in order to keep that pathway. The red one is a, what we call a business as usual scenario. So what's behind these scenarios uh, is different uh, development pathways of our society. So different options of our society, how we deal with energy in the future and how we cooperate. Of course, then we need also Earth system models, which are simplified representations of the Earth system, the Earth system being then composed by the atmosphere, by the continents and the world oceans and atmosphere, uh, sorry, the continents and the oceans having also the carbon cycle included, which means that there's also a very simplified reproduction, uh, representation of biota in there. So these greenhouse gas scenarios are used as a forcing for the Earth system model, in addition to the natural forcing from um, the, net, the natural radiative forcing. So just have a look at these climate projections of several relevant marine ecosystem stresses. So these panels here show the temporal evolution with the variables plotted with uh, reference to 2090-2099. You have sea surface temperature, uh, global pH change, the ocean oxygen current, and global net productivity. See that the shading around here represents the intermodal de uh, deviation, standard deviation for 10 models, and the lines is the model average. We see that the red scenario, the business as usual, of course, projects quite an increase in surface ocean SSD with quite a spread across the models. The blue line has a much more modest temperature increase. So we see that following different options and pathways, we have um, the possibility to infer of our, on our future climate. Have a look here at the pH. 
All models show a decrease, except the blue one, which shows a slight reversal with time as CO2 is removed from the atmosphere and pH starts to recover. What you also notice is that there isn't any shading around this. The surface ocean pH is directly set by the trajectory of, surf of atmospheric CO2. And since all the models are forced in that exercise with the same CO2 in the atmosphere, the response is similar. Then we have the uh, oxygen content down here with a decrease in oxygen in all scenarios. The decrease in oxygen reflects the increase in temperature. So the response to the increase in temperature is a solubility effect together with the interplay of circulation and ocean ventilation. The next panel shows global net primary productivity, which also an increase here in the business as usual scenario and a really large uncertainty around that projection. So we are moving here from physical variables like SST to chemical ones like pH with a kind of direct control, simple and yet in the surface ocean to thermodynamics, to the oxygen, which is already more complex, combines thermodynamics, biology, and also ocean circulation towards net primary production, which is a variable which is, of course, directly uh, coming from marine productivity, so from the phytoplankton communities. And the, uh, what I would like to stress is that the NPP is a biological result, and this kind of spread in the response shows the uncertainty or the difficulty in modeling and projecting the response of biota in, uh, in, in the future climate. Now, have a quick um, spatial look at these things, perhaps focusing directly on, so we have, again, SST, pH, oxygen concentration, subsurface, and integrated net primary production. The stippling that you see, the little dots on the figures, um, indicate the agreement of the model. So it's a 10 model ensemble. If they agree, there is stippling, and if there is stippling agreement, we uh, speak of a high robustness of our results. If you look at NPP, we see that there is quite some spatial variability in this field. We have areas where NPP decreases, and some areas where it increases. So this is explained at first order by changes in the physical ocean in response to warming. As the ocean warms, the ocean gets more stratified, which means that the surface ocean is increasingly isolated from the ocean, the subsurface ocean. The nutrients sit in the subsurface ocean. The surface ocean gets, in course of a year, exhausted in nutrients through biological productivity. The phytoplankton takes up the nutrients. So if the surface ocean is more isolated from the subsurface, there are less nutrients coming up. This is particularly true here at the mid-latitudes. That's why the productivity is going down. At the high latitude, the same process has a different consequence. Here again, the ocean is also better stratified, but now at the high latitudes with a deep mixed layer, the cells are constantly mixed deeper in the water column and outside of the optimal light regime, then we speak about light limitation. And if that environment, the ocean gets less mixed, the organisms stay more in the optimal light regime and can produce more. And in addition, because there is sea rise retreat in response to warming, the growing sense, uh, season is increased as well. So we have typically this opposing uh, pi uh, picture with increase at high latitudes and decrease of NPP at low latitudes. What you also see is, if you look at the stippling, the stippling, I mean, pH and SSD, you have stipples all over, mostly. It's not the case for NPP. In NPP, there are areas where the models disagree, so areas of high uncertainty, especially also in the area of interest. For you here, the um, South Atlantic, there's little agreement, which means there's high uncertainty on what will happen to that particular area in the future. Now that we have these projections done with what we call lower trophic levels, so by geochemical levels, which go up to zooplankton, we can combine them with levels of higher trophic, uh, sorry, with models of higher trophic levels 
in what's called the end-to-end -end approach, going from the first levels of the ecosystem uh, to the top predator levels, the fish. And this example here is coming from a model which is called apicosm, which is coupled to the Nemo Piscus, which is the Nemo, the physical model, and Piscus, the model that we are using at IPSL. And Apicosm is a size space model. Not going into the details here, just to give you a flavor of what can be done. So these are global averages again of sea surface temperature. You have seen that already, it is increasing. The lower trophic level biomass is decreasing in the projections, this being phytoplankton and zooplankton. If there's less phytoplankton, there's less food for zooplankton, so the biomass is decreases, and this spreads across the food chain up to higher trophic levels, where we see here also a decrease in the different groups that are modeled, included in the model. So I'm not going into details because this is the field of expertise of my colleague William, and he will give you more de details on this. Um, I will move to the next slide, to this consideration. So we are talking uh, up to now about anthropogenic climate change. And we have seen the curves, the response curves of the different variables exemplified. And we see that it is a kind of a, a smooth trend towards, for instance, increasing temperature, decreasing pH. This, um, trend occurs against the backdrop of quite a large natural variability, and that natural variability occurs on various time scales. We have the short time scales, the synoptic time scales, then we have the natural climate variability that occurs on seasonal time scales, interannual to decadal modes. So, in thinking about these time scales, we can also uh, attribute specific phenomena to these time scales. For instance, the synoptic variability occurring on days to weeks has phenomena, phenomena uh, attached to it like harmful algae blooms, jellyfish proliferation, ocean acidification events, coastal hypoxia, lava drifts, extreme events like marine heat waves. Season to decades, we have marine productivity changes, biomass changes, fish stocks and their management, and then the satanal projections is strategic planning and adaptation, for instance, of communities. Oops. So, if another way to look at this is the short time scales by analogy is weather forecast, which we all know, a forecast, a day, what time the weather is there tomorrow, what weather will be there in a week's time. Then we have seasonal to decadal forecast and again climate projections. In terms of model systems, we can use a similar model system to cover all these time scales. However, the, uh, there is a strong difference in the approach we model these time scales. If we have a model system that I said is a simplified representation of the real world, we need to initialize this at time zero to give him some information to the computer code and then the numerical model steps through time towards a solution. And as the model evolves towards its own solution, being the own solution is different from the real observation, it diverts from the real observations. So if we have, a, if you want to know something about a very close future, we are very close to the model initialization. So this is called the initial value problem. And as the model goes through time, it loses its memory from this initial value uh, initialization, and the forcing that we imply, like the greenhouse gas forcing and the radiative forcing, gets increasingly important. And we call this the boundary forcing. And that's why at the extreme end here, we have, we are speaking about the boundary value problem. So that's a little bit the, the uh, technique of modeling. And now, coming back to fisheries, there are different um, uh, problems uh, or questions associated to these time scales. Like a short time scale is industry operation going to monitor and closure annual catches for the immediate time scale, resilience and sustainability for the climate time scale. So I would like now to present an example on the short time scale, the really immediate forecasting. Because 
What we need to do, whatever time scale there is, we need to take into account the natural variability. And that is quite a challenge, because we don't really know how these time scales interact with each other and with climate change. So we need to go beyond statistical models that make a link between a fish stock and the climate, uh, the observed weather. We need to go to a repre uh, mechanistic representation. And this is one example of the management of living marine resources in a dynamic environment. And the example is for Atlantic albacore tuna. Here you see the compilation of catches from ICAT on a 5 to 5 degree grid for the period 87 to 2014 with a distinction of different gear. And the circles give you an indication on the magnitude of catch. So there are quite some strong catches in the area occurring here of interest to us. So what do we need in order to do such a forecast? We need an integrated system, an integrated model system, which has a physical component shown here, coupled to biogeochemistry. These are the lower trophic levels. We need a mid-trophic level model, the prey fields, and then we need the upper trophic levels, in this case for the tuna. So we are using, uh, this example uses the spatial ecosystem and population dynamics model, CIPODIM. This is the age structure spatial population model, which distinguishes various habitats, like a spawning habitat and a feeding habitat, and the organisms move around between, migrate between that, these, those habitats, um, and their migration is driven by the habitat preference and also by the food availability. So we need also environmental forcing, which is then provided by the lower trophic level and the physical model. We need temperature currents, primary production, euphotic death, and dissolved oxygen to describe the habitats. And then the mid-trophic level, also forced by the habitat and representing different six functional groups. I'm not detailing them now. What's important to realize is that the uh, CIPODIM model is actually has, a, has a several parameters, of course, that describe the growth uh, of the organisms of the different size classes. And these parameters are um, optimized through optimization procedure, which needs as input, observations, observations of fish catch. So this is a representation of the workflow from the model setup on optimization to get to these weekly forecasts of Albuca tuna dynamics. The model optimization is done on a historical data set covering 80 to 2050 at a rather coarser resolution model so once the model is optimized, which means that the model result corresponds as closely as possible to the observations, this becomes the initial conditions to the operational model. And then the idea is to run weekly forecasts. So every week the model gets reinitialized to be close to the observation and is then run one week in advance. It's the same system as for weather forecasts. So this is the um, result of the historical optimization of the model. So this is the biomass estimates of Atlantic albacore across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the black curve is what the model gives if we have no fishing. See also there is a little bit of variability and the tendency to decrease. And the red curve is the biomass taking into account fishing. And you see, of course, the fishing has a large impact. And up to now, we believe that the fishing has a higher impact than climate change on these species. Um, I also have to say that this is not an overfish species. At present, in the South Atlantic, the fish catches are, remain below the allowable target. So this slide shows results of model evaluation by comparing observed and model historical catch of the period 1979 uh, to 2010. The map here shows the goodness of fit that is achieved by the model. 
blue colors being bad, badly correlated and up to warmer colors, the correlation increases and then up to one. So I hope that this map convinced you that the model does a rather good job in reproducing the observed uh, catches. Another way to look at this is here the time series. It's the 1,000 megatons of catch and function of time. The data are the stippled lines and the black line is the model. You see the strong interannual variability of the catches which are reproduced by the model. The same is here for the example of the Brazilian longline fisheries. Again, stippled for data and black for the model. So this now is getting an interesting tool that can be used for, I think so, for living marine uh, resource management. It is so actually set up and the operational system is still being put together and should be operational sometime in the next future. So this was a weather forecast example. If you move to the next time scale, we wonder how can this be done? Such a seasonal to decadal exercise could in principle be done with the same model setup. But now we are looking at the prediction of the environmental forcing. How predictable is the environmental forcing? Temperature, current, spiral production, etc. So this, such a decadal forecast with a coupled um, fish model in it hasn't been done today. So the decadal prediction is a rather recent uh, field, also for IPCC, the last report, had a, section, a chapter on decadal prediction, but only for physics. And what we did in our lab, we did the first decade prediction for biogeochemistry. We did it for primary production because it's an important input to higher trophic level models. So to do this, we used then the IPSL Earth system model. And the model was part of the uh, previous IPCC decade prediction exercise. And there's a published paper then. So how do we do this? How, what's the essence of such a decadal approach? As I said, we need a fully coupled Earth system model and we need to initialize the model to get it close to the data. This is done in our case by a very weak and subtle nudging or bringing back model sea surface temperature to observed sea surface temperature. See this here? This is the temperature, sea, sea surface temperature in the uh, Nino, El Nino box. And the observations are in yellow, yellowish here. There is a little bit of a spread because we use different uh, observation products. And the stippled line is the really model outcome. So the Earth system model, as I said, moves along the timeline towards its own resolution. Uh, sorry, solution. So here it has its own dynamics. Statistically, it is close to the real world. It will have a right frequency of El Nino events, for, for instance. But the magnitude of the events might be different, and most importantly, the phasing. So if you want to give an information to management, we need to have a system which is phased to the observations. That's why we do this nudging here. And as a matter of fact, you see that now the model follows the observation much better. So we only touch SST, and look what happened to primary production here. Again, the green one is the observations from several satellite products. And, pff, sorry, the stippled one is the primary model output, and the uh, black one, it's the uh, nudged model. So we've, we correct SST, and we have a strong positive effect on NPP, net primary production. Now, how is this run done? Um, this is called a retrospective forecast, which is kind of, I find, a funny word because it's a, it's a forecast, but back over historical period. So it's a, it's a approach that is done in the community to assess the model skill. And what we do, so we have the nut simulation and every year we stop the nudging or the correction towards observations in the model, and the model runs three. We do that for three members and for 10 years. And the three members are a little bit perturbated 
at the outstart of this simulation. So they're not fully identical. Um, and what you get then is shown on this plot. We have the ensemble mean in blue and uh, in red the spread of this then unnatched or free simulations. We do that every, every year. So these plots here show the capacity of the free simulation to follow, follow the natched one. It's done here for NPP and for SST. After one year, so we combine all the simulations, all the starting dates, and after one year, we look at all the results and we combine them together. And in that particular case, it is compared actually to the observations. So how close, how good is the model to follow the observed trajectory after one year and after, uh, for SST and NPP? And again, red is the correlation coefficient, red being better than blue. See, there are areas coming up here for NPP in the Equatorial Pacific, which have a quite strong um, correlation. In the area here of Brazil, it is very weak. We have SST also in the Pacific, this big blob here over the El Nino period, and this essentially is also what is used to do El Nino forecasts and predictions. And again here, not much, very low predictability. Now we could look at the same thing, but two to five years ahead, which is of course much more different because, more difficult because the model is losing the memory of the initial state. If you look at SST, there is hardly any predictability left in the equatorial Pacific. And by the way, the hatching here corresponds to the area where we have large tuna catches. If you look at NPP, we still have these pockets of high predictability. So in that case, there might be events or years where the NPP can be predicted much longer ahead than the SST, which to us came as a surprise. So how can this be explained? So as I said, each starting date, we remove the nudging, so the correction. The nudging, so the correction of SST, it's phasing of SST, has uh, incidence on the, on the mixed layer dynamics. It has an incidence on the upwelling of nutrients. And so the nutrient supply, which ultimately drives the net primary production in the surface ocean. The SST, being warmer or colder, has also an incident on the growth rates of phytoplankton, which again has an impact on NPP. So what happens actually is that from the physical system moving to the biochemical, the bio biological system, there is one point where the biological system loses, it's no longer that strongly controlled by surface ocean dynamics and the high frequency variability of these surface ocean dynamics. Because the biology is controlled by temperature also, but the temperature in the surface ocean is also controlled by the upwelling of colder waters. And, of course, the productivity is highly controlled by nutrients. So we are creating nutrients anomalies, or we, the system, creates nutrients anomalies in the surface oceans, which translate into anomalies, so changes in NPP, which then are carried away by the ocean circulation. And we think that that leads ultimately to the increased predictability. And the question is now, this happens in the Equatorial Pacific. In a second study, it has been verified for the North Pacific. But the question is really, how predictable are these biological variables? And what processes lends, the, lends predictability to them? As I said, this is an emerging field. So we are really, really at the starting point of this. And we still need to do a lot of work in order to find the answers and ultimately also figure out how predictable is physics by geochemistry in the South Atlantic. So the management of living marine resources on this short seasonal to decadal prediction uh, time uh, t scales requires um, the, an integrated model system, as I have presented. So if you look back and ask ourselves, where do we stand? Where is the community over the past years? There has been a significant progress 
in the development of these systems. And now we have coherent model systems for various applications across timescales. But what really remains a challenge and a problem is the complexity of the biogeochemical component. And of course, then the biolog biology is even more complex. So, and we need to have an improved integration of physics, biogeochemistry, lower trophic levels, mid and upper trophic levels. And then, of course, we need to bridge the scales. What I showed is, for example, some spatial uh, global models, but the resources and a lot of fisheries is uh, actually going on on the shelf. I mean, I have examples from tuna, which are ocean op is an open ocean resource, but many resources are tied to the shelf, and these models are not skillful in, due to the resolution to, be, to give uh, skillful on the shelf the physical models to start out with. So we need to bridge these spatial scales. And we need to get a better understanding on the predictability of key physical, chemical, and biological variables on longer time scales. Then, as I said, we need data. So these models are run with data assimilation schemes, and they need to be revi uh, revisited to, for the coupling to bio biology. And most of all, what we also need, we don't, not only models, we need really observations. So we need a sustained effort in observing systems coming from physics all the way to biology. We need access to fishing data. As I have said, CPODIM is optimized using historical fishing data. So if there's not enough fishing data out there or they are biased, then the model will be, well, might give a bad prediction. So, and we need to have the end user communities to be involved during the planning and developing of these tools. We need to know their needs and to understand their cultural environment. So if, just, I would like to finish with an outlook. So what might be there in, well, 10 years, if I'm optimistic, perhaps 15 years time scales. So I think in the future, the management of living marine resources in a dynamic environment will benefit from these improved integrated physical biogeochemical models. The global models will be run at increasingly high resolution, like what Maria showed, the example was at 112 I saw. So this is a really much higher than what I had here. There will be novel observations that will feed in in these systems. For example, the biogeochemical Argo fleet, which is just now being deployed. So there will also be novel data streams for the system evaluation. There's also like environmental genomics out there now. And all this will provide the boundary condition for the regional models, as I said, for the specific, specific region and shelf under interest. So these regional applications, they will be tailored to the particular system that we need that under scrutiny of interest. So this uh, regional application will have complexity that will directly reflect the system under study. For instance, offshore Brazil is a different system than obviously the North Sea, and we don't need the same, um, we need different complexity, different organisms and groups in there. And these systems will be coupled to ecological impact assessments model. And of course, ultimately, the socio-economic uh, economical uh, dimension will be integrated as well. So this was my last slide, and I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mario. I think for us it's a, it's a real pleasure to have all this explanation <clears throat> on what the global models are showing and how does it work. I think you made a, a comprehensive uh, presentation on a lot of this. And do you like to take some questions now or maybe um, after all? Maybe it can be now, right? Yeah. Is there, yes, we have, because we, we started a little bit later. Do we have some questions uh, for, um, for the audience? Um, some particular question? Oh, from your side as well, for Marion? 
You, if you're more comfortable, you can also uh, ask your question in Portuguese, of course. But if nobody has questions, I, I'll pose one, yeah? Um, because you said about um, the importance of uh, fishing data and local data in models, like the one you show on Cipodim, and But I want to know in the terms of the global model, I mean the, the uh, and the, bar, the boundary um, conditions at regional level, right? You, you mentioned this and the importance of local data, right, on that. So I want you, if you, can, you could like explore a little bit more on, on the importance of this for the predictions and for the projections, which is, yes, the local data, it, because it seems it can be obvious for you, but maybe it's not obvious for, for the audience to understand the importance of local uh, conditions in the, the global models. So there, there are se several aspects to this. I think that the, the management questions, with the exception of this uh, uh, open ocean stocks like tuna, The management questions are local and in EEZs, often. And so the global models have, a, as I said, a cost resolution. So the, the, they don't resolve the particular processes that are close, for instance, uh, to the coast or on the continental shelf. And in order to resolve these processes, um, I think one way to go is to have nests, so model grids with much higher resolution in that particular area. But we need to, um, to get the, the information from the global ocean into this domain. Uh, on the continental shelf, there is exchange of water masses towards the open ocean, from the open ocean on the continental shelf. So we need um, to have, that's what's called a, a boundary, and we put information on this boundary. So that we can uh, take a climatology, for instance, but... Yeah, that is done. But that is not so good because then the forcing is every time step the same and we know there is variability. So the ideal case is then to take the boundary from the global model. But of course we need to know how good the model is. And in order to this to have this, we need data. There is, the ocean is vastly undersampled still. So we start to have, what I said, climatologies, but the climatologies don't allow us to pick up the variability and the trend. And we need to have local data in order to evaluate the model locally. I can't simply take the model and say that in the middle of the Atlantic it gives a good biomass, and then say because it's good in the middle of Atlantic, it's also good on the Brazilian shelf. That makes simply no sense. And it's also important to have local data, I mean, not, uh, not one data point on the shelf every 10 years. We need a time series. And ideally, the time series should be kept, I mean, by essence, the time series is kept, but as long as possible. Because in order to identify uh, a trend in response to climate change, it usually takes several decades. So it would be good to start now to get the systems into place and then we have to keep in mind that we have to keep them for several generations. And this information is very important and then when it comes to fishing information it is also very important. I know many uh, countries run surveys and they organize in a different way, but there are surveys, and this information is very important uh, to control, to uh, evaluate and optimize the model over the historical period. So we need uh, good data on the abundance of the species and also on the landings, etc. Did that answer your question? And you know this is a challenge in our countries, to get this kind of data. In countries like Brazil, we have a lot of problems in, in having time series of data, to having fisheries data correctly, and the systems working on a good monitoring in a larger scale, yeah? 
Um, would you have some tip, tips on on what to deal with this? Uh, not to solve how to solve it in the country level, of course, but which uh, could be the most important variables, maybe, for you to, to just say, okay, uh, you have problems in, in having data. Um, uh, we, we don't know how, but they are really important in the EZ, in your country, but also in, for, for having the improvement of global models. But do you have some uh, tip on which will be the main variables, maybe, or the most important variables? Uh, I mean, to, to the global model, to, to your expertise, uh, you know, not, not just for us, because for us we know that... Uh, we are trying to understand our processes. We have certain data to do this, but my question is on your models. Yeah? I don't know if you have some, some suggestion. <laughs> That's a tough one because uh, the models are used for various uh, questions. So I would say it's often, it might be quite basic actually. If you think that the um, if you have temperature, salinity, oxygen is a good one, and uh, nutrients, and for instance, silicon. Because I'm saying this, I'm, saying, I'm, say, I'm picking this out because the, um, the show an interaction between the, the circulation, so the physical ocean, temperature, salinity, but then if we add oxygen, we have an information on addition, well, on the ventilation is physics too, but also on, um, on the biological processes, primary production and the respiration. The uh, source and sinks, so production and consumption of oxygen. So with oxygen, we start to integrate more processes. That's, I think, it's a good candidate. Uh, dissolved silica, it's... It's also interesting because it is uh, a nutrient, a macronutrient, which controls diatoms. And it also uh, traces circulation quite well. And then, of course, another nutrient would be good, for instance, nitrate. Um, yes, and then, this wish list gets longer. If you're interested in ocean acidification and in carbon cycle, which I think we... Even if the target is fisheries, which might become an issue, and to be also relevant in a broader sense, even more relevant, it would be good to have two measurements from uh, the uh, CO2 system, like alkalinity and total dissolved carbon. So you see, I didn't mention any biomass here, because then the idea is, I mean, I mean, can come up with this and this and this, and we'll talk until sunset. But I think these uh, physical chemical measurements, which are not too expensive to do, and which can be with uh, some training done in, with a good accuracy, and which allow um, to put a, a good constraint by your chemical lower level model. Okay, thank you very much. I hope this is this will be useful to my biogeochemist uh, colleagues here in in Brazil and understand the connection of all of these with fisheries and for the future, what the countries will expect, how they will impact on all of this happening, right? Yes, I, I as I said, it's biogeochemistry, but the idea is if you have this integrate, we have the. It is, I think it is easier, also economically and training-wise, to, to get the good control on the model, this biogeochemical models. Then, and from there, we go then, we, we model the, the correct and improved biomass distribution, which then the model. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. So coming from a bottom-up uh, model, we can move to the next uh, presenter. And then, Marion, if you don't mind, we can take uh, some question at the end also for, for a general discussion, right? So 
now I think that moving to from the bottom up uh, in the ocean, can we say for the top down? Certain, yeah. yeah? Um, so we're gonna have this overview of a different perspective now. Uh, oh, uh, again, we're uh, trying to see advanced science and global models, uh, but now from a different, different perspective, right? So it would really complement, I think it would be really interesting. So thank you very much, uh, William. And um, as I told you, I already introduced William Chang from UBC, uh, University of British Columbia. And I think we can have uh, sort of 40, 45 minutes, right? For you to, to show us your, your talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mary and Marian. Um, and uh, I think Marian's talk really give um, a good foundations um, and really interesting science and, and, and insight um, into the talk that I'm going to talk about, um, which is uh, linking the changes in the oceans and how that affects fishes, marine organisms in general, and also people, people who are dependent directly or indirectly uh, on the oceans and the marine ecosystem. So I have two sets of lumber here, uh, 1 billion versus 9.7 billion, 700 billions versus 100,000 billion, and 0.2 billions versus 700 billions. I want you to kind of reflect uh, for a few seconds uh, and make a guess of what these two sets of lumbers correspond to. These are three attributes of the defilements of the society. The first one is population between two periods, 1800 and 2050, which is the projected future populations of, the, of this planet of Earth. And second one is our economic development, uh, as indicated by our gross domestic products, GDP. Um, and in the last century or so, we, our population has grown tremendously and is projected to grow continuously. Along with that is a very rapid economic growth, uh, partly driven by lots of innovations, uh, and it is also partly driven by the ability for us to generate and use uh, a vast source of energy from fossil fuel. But with the increase in wealth of the society and bringing with us increase in well-being and the use of materials and things like that, there's also byproducts. And this byproduct is affecting um, our Earth and the oceans. So the last one is the global cumulated emissions of carbon dioxide, uh, which is from, uh, from uh, several orders met to increase in the last century. And these changes in society and uh, economic activities and human activities and the subsequent impacts on the environment has been detected um, all over the world um, in different um, attributes, both on land and the ocean. This is a figure showing the great accelerations of human drivers in the Anthropocene. So this is the year where human is really having a big uh, signature on different Earth system, or of the Earth systems and different attributes of the Earth system. The left-hand side is the socioeconomic trends, such as some of the things that I showed you earlier on, world population, GDP, on the right-hand side, those are Earth system trends. And Marion already mentioned some of those uh, in her talk about the ocean changes. For example, she talked about ocean acidification. If you look at that, um, that rapid acceleration of ocean acidification in the last century, and that's co closely related to the amount of carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere through burning of fossil fuel. We also have coastal nitrogen that is also rapidly increasing in the last, five and, uh, last century, which is partly because of the la large increase in the use of um, and development of uh, fertilizers uh, for agriculture that then go into the oceans and between, providing a lot of nutrients um, to the oceans, but then at the same time leading to some of the negative consequences such as harmful algal bloom. And lastly, that I want to highlight is the rapid increase in our explorations of the sea through fisheries. Uh, we see a massive increase in fisheries catches in the last 50 years or so. 
Particularly if we focus on this region, the North, the Southwest Atlantic Oceans, we find also similar trends as the global, global fisheries um, trajectory. This is based on the global fisheries catch statistics collated from both the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organizations, as well as additional data from uh, a project of my colleagues uh, at University of British Columbia. Overall, what we see is that um, there is a rapid increase in annual fisheries production uh, in the last 60 years or so in this region. But you will notice that by around 1990s, global fisheries catch already uh, reached a maximum. And after that, uh, the catch fluctuates around uh, 3 million tons. Another thing I want to, to, to highlight is that uh, the fisheries catches actually contribute to different sectors of the society as well as for different uses. So in here, I separated the global fisheries catch into three different uh, sectors. Industrial fisheries catch, which is a lot of it won by a uh, big, bigger company um, or industrial fishing fleets. We also have in these regions a quite substantial catch for artisanal and subsistence fisheries, particularly from smaller coastal fishing communities, which are very important for their livelihood, uh, as well as in some cases for food, um, as well as culture. And lastly, there is um, actually a notable recreational fisheries, highlighting that the oceans also provide services to support our cultural well-being as well. But various analyses have shown that uh, we are also ex overexploiting the fish stocks in the, these regions. And that partly contributes to the reasons why we cannot continue to increase our fisheries catch since the 1990s. For example, in one analysis, it is estimated that almost 50% of the fish stocks in the Southwest Atlantic regions is considered to be overexploited or collapsed. So it means that we are in these regions and actually in the world, we are at maximum capacity in producing fish, at least for traditional fish stocks. The next question then is, what will be the future in the next 500, 50 or 100 years? Would fisheries catch continue to decline? Or can we sustain the current level of catch and support um, the needs of people who are dependent on fisheries and other activities? So that becomes a, a important question that lots of my research actually try to answer. And one of the main reasons driving the need to answer this question is that the natural systems and human well-being are interconnected. I already highlighted that um, there are direct implications of changes in the fish stocks and catches to different fishery sectors. But then there are also a lot of other people who are dependent on the oceans directly or indirectly. And fisheries, as well as other aspects of marine ecosystems, connect to those aspects of well-being of people. So in these talks, first of all, based on my own research and some of the research that my colleague did, I will highlight and explain the future prospect, the current understanding of the future prospect of fisheries and human communities, particularly under climate change. As Marion highlights, uh, we are facing a real challenge of changing ocean conditions. So we want to understand what the future oceans is like with these changing climate and oceans. And secondly, I don't want you to leave these presentations or in this room with a really sad feeling that uh, the Earth is going to um, be destroyed in the next few decades. There are actually potential solutions and actual solutions that we can do now. So I want to give you some optimism by highlighting some of those potential solutions and how, what, can, what we can do to deal with those problems. And ultimately, I also want to highlight that innovative, integrated, and interdisciplinary approaches are actually necessary to both evaluate this problem as well as to find potential solution options and implement these options to have a sustainable future Earth and oceans. So the basic premises of this is that the ocean around us is changing and Maryland gave already a very compelling evidence that the ocean is changing in the past and that it's going to change. Of particular uh, notable changes that are, that are important for the marine ecosystems, fish stocks, and fisheries are changes in temperature, 
changes in sea level, so sea level is increasing, the ocean is warming up, we are acidifying the oceans with a decrease in pH, as well as a decrease in oxygen content because of increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I also want to take this opportunity to highlight two contrasting scenarios that we're facing in the future for climate change. The red one is called the business as usual or representative concentration pathway 8.5 technically um, scenario. It means continuous emissions of carbon dioxide like what we did in the last few decades into the 21st century. So that would mean a really high level of warming, high level of ocean acidification, etc. But we also have a something called strong mitigation scenario, meaning that uh, we are going to be able to strongly mitigate uh, climate change on CO2 emissions, and by doing so, we can keep we uh, maintain uh, warming to a low level, um, and also to reduce substantially the level of ocean nestification. So with this alternative future, what would be, it be like for fish, fisheries, and human-dependent communities? To understand that, we, need, we really need to take an interdisciplinary approach because the changing oceans, physical and chemical conditions, like what Mario explained, would affect different levels of organizations of the marine system. It affects the biology of organisms, it affects then the growth, reproduction, mortality, that affects the population dynamics. And different species will change their interactions and compositions, leading to changes in community structure and ecosystem interactions and ecosystem functions. At the same time, these changes will affect economic activities of human-dependent communities, such as fishing, and at a much broader scale, Changes in society, such as changes in human populations, changes in seafood demand, or changes in energy price, would also have an effect on marine ecosystems. And these changes interact with one another, so there are feedbacks within each least layer of, um, of organization. So to really understand how changes in the oceans affect marine systems, both human and, and natural systems, we really need to take this interdisciplinary approach. For fish, one of the key aspects that we have already observed and we know a lot about in response to climate change is the shift in species distribution. For example, the fish may, will distribute along a depth gradient and a latitudinal gradient. But when the ocean warms up or when other conditions of the ocean change, it may become not suitable for them, for the fish to live because uh, Fish, like many other marine organisms, their body temperature is dependent on the environmental temperature. So when temperature increases or decreases from their optimal conditions, their body functions will decrease, and at some point, the temperature may become too hot or too cold for them to live, and they will die. But they, the fish or other invertebrates uh, would not stay put and die when the ocean conditions change. They would actually shift their distribution in order to adapt to these changes in ocean conditions. In most cases, they would follow the environmental gradients by shifting their distributions towards higher latitude regions or deeper water where they can find cooler refuge for them to live under a warming ocean. But these kind of changes would have implications for ecosystems because the newly expanded uh, that a uh, range of the species may interact with new predators or prey, leading to ecosystem changes. At the same time, it will also affect human activities and ocean management. If there's a protected area that is designated for protecting these species, which is Atlantic cod, um, such protected area would decrease in its effectiveness if the species actually move away from the protected area. It may also lead to political debate and dispute. For example, if this fish stock is shared between two countries and that now the fish stocks move from one country to another, then in this case, country A will gain while country B will lose. And there will maybe a dispute of how they want to share the fish stocks um, in, in their, for their fisheries. And in fact, we, are already, we already have observed um, 
a range shift for a wide variety of different marine species because ocean is already warming up. It is not something that is going to happen in the future. We are already seeing ocean warming. For example, this is a meta-analysis done by uh, a colleague, a team of colleagues, who look at a published uh, data set on distribution range for a wide variety of different marine species, from benthic algae, planktons, to fish, and, uh, and sharks. What they find is that for majority of the species, almost all of the species except, not, except sharks, um, there were a um, significant shift in distribution range to a high latitude region. So when the, the, um, the blue dot is above the red line, it means that uh, the distribution is shifting towards the high latitude regions or cooler water. And the shift is from tens to hundreds of kilometers per decade. And these changes are also affect, are already affecting our fisheries catches. We did an analysis analyzing the global fisheries catch data from around the world. And uh, our hypothesis is that if species are shifting their distributions forward, fisheries catch may be already catching more and more warm water species where they are moving from the tropical area to high latitude region. So in this case, uh, the warm water species are not as uh, wet fish, while the uh, cooler water species are looked at as blue fish. So over time, when the ocean warms up, uh, you will see more and more wet fish in the fisheries catches. And when we analyze the fisheries data, what we found on the right hand side of this figure, you see the, the increase in red line, which indicate an increase in dominance of warmer water fish. So we use a matrix called mean temperature of the catch, or what we call MTC, which is the average of the mean preference temperature of fish within the fisheries catches. So the increasing dominance of more warm water preferred fish will increase that index of MTC. And we find that that increase actually correlates significantly with ocean temperature, even after we account for the effects of large-scale oceanographic influences, as well as fishing effort. But in the tropical area, the picture is slightly different. There is an in initial increase in mean temperature of the catch, meaning that initially there is actually increased dominance of warmer water species. But after that, the mean temperature of the catch level off, even though temperature continues to increase. At first, we were puzzled about this trend, which is out of our expectation. But then, after looking at the, our hypothesis, this actually makes sense. If you look at the schematic diagram again on the uh, right-hand panel, it illustrated in the tropical area, because right now it is already in the hottest part of the ocean. So it means that initially, when the ocean warms up, some of the cooler water species in the tropic may, may actually decrease in abundance, leading to increase in mean temperature of the catch. But then after that, leaving behind are those species that are all warm water tolerant species that can remain in the tropical area. The question is whether in the future, if temperature continues to increase, whether those fish will continue to stay or not. Unfortunately, what we find is that we use computer simulation models to answer that question. It may be that our projection shows that it may be that uh, those species in the tropic may not be able to continue to sustain in the tropical area. In this particular analysis, we analyzed a thousand more fish stocks uh, around the world using our computer simulation models and make projections of how their distribution will shift in the future and how that would affect the species' richness around different ocean basins. The upper map shows area where new species will occur because of species shifting their distributions. And here, it highlights that species will shift into high latitude regions, leading to a high rate of species invasion, so meaning species will increase in number um, in those areas, which is highlighted in red area, and those areas is in high latitude regions, such as the polar regions, uh, Arctic regions especially. But the lower graph highlights something that is even more worrying, which is a map of local extinction, meaning that species will disappear from those areas. And those areas concentrate along tropical areas where species will shift away because continuous increase in temperature and other ocean conditions 
make those areas really not suitable even for tropical species to live, leading to uh, a large rate of local extinction. There are also patches of high rate of local extinctions in semi and coast seas, such as the Mediterranean, where species have problems finding new area to move because if they are encoased by land, uh, so there's a limited area where they can shift their distribution range. And in this region, in the Southwest Atlantic, there will be a mixture of effects where there you, you likely to see new species moving in, while there will be species of also moving away from different areas. We particularly then look at um, what is the risk of extinction of some of the species. So we use a risk assessment approach looking at the degree of exposure to climate hazards, the sensitivity of the different species based on their biology and life history characteristics, as well as how adaptable they are to the new environment. We use information from the projections of Earth system model that Marion show, as well as basic biological inf information from public global database of fish and invertebrates, such as fish base and sea life base. In this particular uh, analysis uh, that I'm going to show, I picked those species that are occurring in the Southwest Atlantic, so in this part of the oceans. What we find is that almost under the basis as usual scenario, almost 90% of the species actually will have high to very high risk of extinction or uh, conservation risk, as highlighted by the, uh, by the uh, very high and the high uh, part of the circle. And um, some of the examples of species that would have high, very high climate risk include tarpon, uh, which is a coastal species, um, and uh, live in coastal estuary, um, with an index value of 88. So 100 is the maximum value, and 100 means that there's a really, really high risk uh, from climate change impacts, while one is low risk. Another example is a megafauna, ducky shark, but what does this mean? What does this index mean? We try to actually relate that to um, the upgrade and well, widely used um, metrics of extinction risk. In this case, the IUCN red list of, low, uh, of extinction risk. And we find that there is significant uh, relationship, we establish significant relationship between our index and the risk of extinctions as identified by IUCN. And for species such as tarpon or dusky sharks, with a, 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 an index value of 88. It means that there are two in three chance that these species will, have, uh, will be endangered. So either vulnerable, endangered, critically endangered. But the thing is, these two species currently are already considered to be vulnerable under the IUCN red list. So it means that climate change is going to add to this currently extinction risk which put them into a really, really dangerous conditions for, for extinction. And these changes in species habitats and their, their abundance would have direct implications for fisheries catches. So we use our models, our simulation models, to make projections of future changes in fisheries catches by combining the species distributions uh, and the amount of primary protections that are available for fish to synthesize these energies into protections of biomass and make projections under different uh, scenarios. And in this case, we look at the scenarios as different degree of atmospheric warming. So in, under the business as usual scenario, we are expect to see a 4 degrees Celsius increase in global surface temperature by the end of the century. But if we are to achieve the Paris Agreement, then the idea is to have temperatures of around 1.5 degrees Celsius. So here, the contrast is that if we, under the business as usual, at 4 degrees Celsius, we are going to see globally around a 10% decrease in global fisheries catches. It is equivalent to around a 3.4 million tons decrease in global fisheries catches per degree Celsius warming. And there are regional differences. For example, in this part of the coast, for example, in the northern Brazil shell, there, we project a really substantial decrease in fisheries catches uh, under a basis as usual or up to a 4 degrees Celsius warmer world. The decrease in catch potential is actually around 40% decrease uh, by the end of century relative to now. 
So that's almost uh, a, a, a two, more than two third, uh, one third decrease in, in uh, global fisheries, uh, uh, the fisheries catch in the northern Brazilian shelf. While there was slightly less uh, decrease, uh, up to 20% uh, in the southern Brazilian shelf. But then still a 20 to 40% decrease under business as usual is a substantial impact, has a substantial impact on fishing sectors and coastal communities. But um, the Brazilian shelf is not the, uh, the most, even, even with this big decrease, it is not the biggest, most vulnerable area. The most vulnerable areas in the world is actually other tropical area where you, the conditions become not suitable for fish to live, such as the uh, Indo-Pacific region where uh, we are going to see broadly a more than uh, almost 40% decrease in fisheries catches. And this would then have implications for the revenue or the economic uh, impacts on the fishing communities as demonstrated by the red color on land, which shows uh, the decrease in fisheries revenue, that is the amount of money that fishermen can get by selling their fish um, in the future. So there is a substantial decrease in um, in fishery revenue, both, for example, in Brazil or uh, more seriously in other tropical areas uh, under the business as usual scenario. And some of the communities are particularly impacted, not because of economic reason, but because of health reason. For example, uh, in South America, we uh, estimated that uh, Peru um, or Guyana um, the coastal communities are strongly dependent on fish as a source of micronutrients such as omega-3 fatty acid, zinc, iron. Without fish, they may, there's, a like, there's a good chance that they will suffer from um, uh, nutrition deficient disease uh, because of this deficiency uh, in, in, in uh, micronutrients from seafood. Uh, they don't currently have much alternative sources for this kind of micronutrient. And these areas, some of these areas with high dependence on fish for micronutrients are also areas where we project a large decrease in fisheries catches. So that's actually even uh, have a stronger impact uh, on those coastal communities besides the, uh, the economic impacts that I just showed you. And even in some of the developed countries, uh, there are also vulnerable communities, like in Canada. You would imagine that uh, Canada is a high latitude region. We are going to see fish moving in. Some fish will be moving out. But within Canada, uh, there, is, there are indigenous people who are strongly dependent on uh, fisheries and coastal resources. And particularly, their culture and their fisheries and their local knowledge are tied to particular species, such as salmon or herring. So when those species decrease in abundance and catches under climate change, that would have a substantial impact on their livelihood as well as for their food security. So in this case, for example, we project um, uh, under the business as usual scenarios uh, as shown by the uh, orange color, Pacific herring would have a 50% decrease in catch potential, salmon 30%, and those species are strongly uh, are main species that many coastal First Nations along the coast of British Columbia are dependent on. So the message is, even in developed countries, there are uh, inequity in the sharing of the costs and benef uh, benefits from climate change, and that some of the vulnerable and dependent communities can be uh, also very, uh, can be impacted. Internationally, these shift in distributions will challenge uh, international ocean governance. In this particular analysis that we published a couple of months ago, we relate uh, shifting distributions to international agreement of managing transboundary fish stocks. Trans transboundary fish stocks are those fish stocks that are shared between countries. This uh, 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 tuna, as uh, described at the, uh, uh, and, and talked about by Merwin, is a good example of transboundary fish stocks. But what we find based on our model is that there will be increasing amount of fish stocks that will move from one country to another. So it means that species, uh, countries may actually be in dispute of sharing those newly transboundary fish stocks in the future as the oceans warms up. So the red color here shows the number of fish stocks will become transboundary in the next, um, by the end of the century. While the white hand side uh, 
shows the number of countries with, with uh, at least one uh, transboundary fish stock that will newly emerge uh, under different global warming scenario, meaning that the more the global warming will continue, the more countries will actually experience or having these transboundary issues. And we are already seeing examples of dispute and uh, international argument because of these transboundary issues. In the North Atlantic, um, the Atlantic uh, mackerel is fish dogs shift north and go into uh, increasing abundance like in countries such as uh, Iceland. And that really leads to international dis dispute between Iceland and other uh, European countries in sharing of the Atlantic mackerel fish stocks. The media frame it as macro war because uh, of the, the intensive debate uh, between countries of the sharing of quotas and resources between the countries. And in this particular analysis, we projected that this kind of dis dispute and, uh, may likely to be more frequent um, in uh, a warming oceans. So I've talked enough about the potential impacts and, uh, and, and uh, and problems that will generate from uh, ocean, uh, from climate change. Uh, but there are still solutions and opportunities that we can take advantage of to deal with some of this problem. This is uh, a quick scanning of different options to deal with these uh, climate change problems in the oceans. We can mitigate, meaning that the, uh, it is the important thing is to reduce global emissions of carbon dioxide which basically deal with the issue, issues of the source problem, the drivers. At the same time, we can adapt. We can protect uh, the environment so that it has a better uh, uh, um, adaptive capacity. Uh, we can rebuild um, depleted fish stocks so that, again, it has uh, it helped to compensate for some of the um, um, uh, impacts from climate change. Um, there are also other activities, um, adaptation activities for human communities, such as uh, uh, alternative livelihood um, or uh, uh, relocations, migrations. Uh, there can be also some more innovative but more risky interventions, such as uh, assisted evolution um, or geoengineering, which are much more uncertain, but they are also may have a negative impacts uh, on both marine ecosystem and the environment. And uh, one thing that brings us with some optimism is that uh, of Paris Agreement, the global communities um, agree on the, a, a very ambitious goal of uh, uh, capping uh, global emissions to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and which is uh, based on our analysis, shows that uh, it would actually substantially reduce and limit the impacts of climate change on the oceans. For example, Take the largest uh, impacted area in the oceans that we project for fisheries. In this case, um, for a 3.5 degrees Celsius warming world, so it's almost like a uh, business as usual scenario, in the Indo-Pacific region, we projected that if the fishermen now is catching 10 fish, everything being equal, they are going to catch half of what they are catching now under that scenario. So if you are a fisherman, imagine that you are catching 10 fish now, a day, but you are going to catch five fish only in the future with a warming world. You can imagine that will be a substantial hit to your income and livelihood. But with the Paris Agreement, the decrease in catch is only by one fish. So if you are catching 10 fish now, you may be only be catching nine fish under the Paris Agreement future. And, well, one fish less I think uh, uh, you or the fishermen can deal with that uh, by other adaptation measures. So it highlights that by achieving the Paris Agreement, it really helped uh, in uh, a brought better prospect of other adaptation measures to be effective. There are various uh, adaptation measures that we also know that it is working and that they bring in uh, a lot of co-benefits because they will also solve other environmental issues such as protecting and restoring habitats, uh, reduce climate, uh, climate sensitivity of fish stocks, uh, we should better manage the oceans, reduce um, overfishing, and improve ocean governance. 
and mitigate other ocean stresses such as pollution so that we can build uh, adaptive capacity of natural systems as well as reducing climate pollutant interactions. I will give you some example from our research that actually shows that these kind of adaptation measures work. One example is uh, one of my PhD students, Ravi uh, Mah Mahajers, uh, work in the Caribbean. Um, he looked at coral fish stocks, uh, fisheries catch in the Caribbean region. What he found is that countries with bigger coral reefs tend to have much smaller changes in fish communities under the same level of warming. So it means that if the countries are able to protect their coral reefs, uh, maintain a large area of coral reefs, their coral reef fish communities and fisheries would also be less sensitive to climate change. This is kind of the analysis that she showed, but I won't go into that in detail. So. And um, one way to protect habitats is by marine protected area. And um, we are already increasing the amount of oceans that we, are, we have been protected uh, substantially uh, in the last few decades. Uh, this is a graph showing the area of protection in the oceans in the last few decades. But we are still under the international goals that we set out um, by 2020, which is uh, um, the ARCHI target uh, of the Convention on Biological Diversity of 10% of global um, marine oceans to be protected. And by around, uh, uh, this is uh, slightly outdated, but um, even with the latest uh, destinations of large protected area, I think we are still uh, off the uh, target. But I think uh, by, um, so there, there is this, um, and at the same time, a lot of the marine protected areas are still not effectively managed. So there's also the, the need for uh, increasing the effective management of marine protected area. And um, another aspect of marine protected area issue is that uh, the, a lot of the protected area currently de are designated without considerations of climate change. So as I said earlier, with uh, species shifting their distributions and changing habitats, uh, if we do not think about uh, climate change in setting a protected area, it may be that uh, the effectiveness of protected area will be decreased. For example, uh, when species shift their distributions uh, and the shift is more than what the size of the MPA are designated for, then it may mean that uh, the MPA will decrease in effectiveness in covering those important species that the, the protected area want to conserve. And currently, when we analyze the global marine protected areas um, in the world and look at how uh, the size of the protected area and whether the size is comparable to the shift in distributions of marine species. And we find that, roughly speaking, only about 1% of the global marine protected areas are large enough to encompass expected marine species when shift. So a lot of the areas are either too small um, to, uh, to, to actually uh, with, and capture the, the range shift of the species. And that's just one indication of whether existing marine protected areas are prepared for climate change. So it means that we need to rethink how MPA should be designed or adjust uh, whether we should uh, have bigger MPA or we should actually have um, a um, more network designed MPA. But we should also consider uh, also the, um, how this would uh, interact with the um, needs and the development aspirations of coastal communities. So it is a, a challenge. It is a challenge because uh, it brings in lots of different dimensions of issues in considerations of designing MPA, both the biophysical aspect as well as the human needs. The third example that I'm going to show you is um, about um, high seas management. So if, in this particular exercise, uh, we try to look at the large marine protected areas in the high seas and see whether it can help coastal states to adapt to climate change. What we find is that if we can actually um, increase um, the uh, conservation status of transboundary fish stocks in the high sea, 
such as tuna, like the Apco tuna that my will show, it can benefit coastal state, and some of the benefits can actually compensate for the loss from climate change. Because when, when fish stocks build up in the uh, open oceans, they would, a lot of them have migration route back into the coastal area, where coastal fisheries would be benefited by that increase in abundance and productivity uh, of fish stocks moving into their waters. And in our simulation models and analysis, we show that with climate change, um, some of the uh, benefits can be obtained uh, and used to compensate for the impacts of climate change on coastal fisheries. But the benefits can only be um, attained uh, as a reasonable way to compensate for the loss under a low emission scenario. At business as usual scenario, the country still will be largely impacted because the ocean conditions will become will, will be not suitable for fish to, to, to move in, even though um, there are good fisheries management. So overall, the insights for mitigation and adaptation is that achieving the Paris agreements of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius would actually have large benefits to fisheries. So we should engage with mitigations, um, try at task um, to achieve um, uh, good mitigations of limiting global warming and the effects on the oceans. There are also large opportunities for climate risk reduction through uh, better management of the oceans, through fisheries management, through reductions of pollution, through protections of habitat. And there are going to be changes in the oceans that challenge international governance, such as uh, international fisheries management. And we should think ahead of how to deal with that. We already know ways that we can deal with this kind of uh, shift in distribution and how that would affect our international fisheries agreement. The important thing is for international agency, um, such as regional fisheries management organizations, to take, to, take, to take those issues seriously and consider them in negotiating and discussing fisheries management um, now. And last but not least, there are strong linkages between oceans and uh, the sustainable environments of the society. So one of the indication is, for example, um, the explicit uh, goals of the, for the ocean's life below water in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And we did an analysis trying to link the ocean sustainable development goals to other, um, sus other sustainable development goals, such as uh, solving hungers um, and, and the, uh, land um, and equity and all aspects of sustainable development. What we find is that there are substantial co-benefits of achieving um, the ocean sustainable development goals to other uh, types of sustainable development. So overall, we cannot achieve sustainable development without considering the oceans. That's the key message from our analysis. So overall, ocean and fisheries are at a crossroad. Solutions are still available and possible. And new knowledge of the coupled humans and natural systems allow us to make develop pathways to a sustainable development. I think the last point is actually the latest frontiers of our of the kind of research that I'm doing, and that uh, um, that is, uh, and also the kind of knowledge that we need to generate to support um, developing uh, pathway, a viable pathway to support development, uh, support sustainable developments, um, and uh, that with consideration of the oceans. So we need more interdisciplinary and integrated science. And I think uh, institute like the advanced institute in here in Sao Paulo is a well uh, place to actually undertake those kind of interdisciplinary research um, to support policy um, and, uh, and, and, and generate knowledge um, to deal with this uh, big climate change problem. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, William, for such a great presentation. I, th I think you have done everything uh, to be published in, in science, so there's nothing left for us to, <laughs> to contribute. <laughs> you did lots of things. It's a, an amazing uh, effort. Um, and thank you. Uh, so I think we, we can take some questions from the people here or even remotely. Tem, tem perguntas enviadas por... Uh, não tem nada enviado? Uh, se vocês quiserem... Uh, oh, 
move to Portuguese, just for uh, trying to get the, the end. If you want to ask questions here, the public is present. You can ask questions in Portuguese, in English, as you want. They don't speak English. I want to know if... In Portuguese, you can speak English. Thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Amanda. Uh, I'm a PG student, a candidate for laboratory, the ecosystem. <laughs> and I, I want to, my question is about the industrial fisheries in Canada. Uh, this kind of information, uh, the, is the fisheries, the fishermen, know about this information and como eles reagiram, como eles reagem? The, the fishermen in Canada, um, if they listen to this kind of, of, of work that you've been done, the results, and how do they re react? To it? Uh, yes, they know about this work. Um, so the, um, we've uh, presented this to uh, First Nation communities, um, for example, uh, a few weeks ago, one of my students who work on the projects that are related to this went to a First Nations conference um, and presented work. Um, in general, they, are, um, they really um, take this seriously because um, they, it highlights um, the direct um, threats to uh, something that is very important for the coastal First Nations. Um, so they really want to learn more about that. And particularly, they also want to know uh, how to uh, deal with the issues. So um, we are uh, currently uh, starting a project to work with um, Coastal First Nations. So it's an uh, interdisciplinary team of colleagues uh, from natural science like me, as well as people who work on uh, um, public health, to look at uh, co-develop kind of uh, adaptation options with them, given this scientific information, and explore what kind of things that uh, the Coastal First Nations can do in order to deal with this expected challenge, whether it can be through uh, changing, uh, adjusting their um, practice, uh, or uh, uh, working with the governments to, um, to to adjust the fisheries management practice. So this is um, we're just starting the projects, but uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to work with the coastal First Nations to develop some solution options. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Thank you for presentation. My name is Marilia Brito from uh, for, uh, Government of São Paulo. In I work with protected areas, and I, I'd like to know your opinion about no-take areas in the con in the context you you showed us, especially this uh, transboundary issue. <laughs> yeah, I think. Um, Nautic areas is um, a one of the toolbox, so one of the uh, options that we can use to help uh, adapt to climate change. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, I, in my opinion, I favor the use of like multiple tools mm -hmm. to deal with the problems. I don't believe in like a single approach that can solve every problem. And the selections of the tools mm -hmm. is. Um, really context specific. So it depends on the needs of the local communities and the governance system in there. It's like if you go to see a medical doctor mm -hmm. for a treatment, they will look at your history, they will look at your body conditions before they decide on what kind of medicine they're going to, or what kind of treatment you're going to give you. And I think this is also the case for managing coastal resources and the climate change. In some cases, um, it can be a large low-tech area, May, uh, may, may be a good solution, while in other cases, it may be actually a, a multiple-use area that would be much more effective with, because of historical uses in the regions or uh, because of a strong dependence of coastal communities that are rely on the coastal resources. So it's really um, dependent on that. But then one aspect that would be important is that I highlighted in my talk is now we need to think also about how these protected areas can um, be um, whether it's effectiveness under climate change. So we need to think about climate change in the yes. design. So one way to do that is through scenario exercise. 
we can look at different scenarios of how climate change will affect both the natural environment as well as the human uh, communities around the region and see how different configurations of um, uh, explore different configurations and management uh, of spatial planning, uh, protected area or no tech area uh, in order to make the, the, uh, the most effective uh, interventions um, to both uh, conserve resources as well as to uh, minimize climate risk. Thank you. I think there is a question from my room, right? William, I would like to, to know your opinion on um, uh, the paper stating that there is an evolutionary pond, a response of uh, fishes to fishing pressure now. And that's the first sub-question. The second one, what is your take on the potential for acclimation and adaptation to modify some of the results of these projections? So it's a really good question. Um, so the question whether the fish or marine organisms can adapt to climate change um, and so can have the amount of impacts that they would have, uh, climate change would have on the marine ecosystem and the organisms. Um, and I think there will be some scope that uh, species will be able to adapt various ways through something called epigenetic, uh, so changes in their body physiology, or um, evolutionary adaptation. So over generations, there, there are some um, aspects of the populations that are more tolerant to, species, uh, to temperature that, then, that they can uh, actually uh, increase the um, but, uh, dominance in the population. But um, I think um, the species would not be fully able to adapt to at least the business as usual changes. And particularly if you look at historical changes, uh, in the last few decades, and even in some of the uh, paleo uh, paleontological evidence. So it's really far into thousands or hundreds of thousands of years of records. It shows that when ocean condition changes, some species go extinct, some species shift their distributions. So if species can adapt fully, um, they should be able to adapt fully in the past. And that, uh, but historical evidence shows that uh, they are responding through shifting distribution range should, uh, through uh, decrease in abundance, meaning that there may be some scope for adaptation, but those scope is limited, and particularly, I don't believe that they won't be, they will be uh, able to fully adapt the business as usual warming scenario. So again, it highlights the need to um, mitigate because with low warming, there may be some chance that some of the species can actually adapt to some of those uh, changes and be, be okay. The one you can discuss. We have some, some minutes for discussion. So. I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other question here from the audience? Vocês querem perguntar alguma coisa mais? Okay. Um, I'll pose a, a, an additional question because when you if, you, if you can make some comment on policy, also advice. Uh, especially when you, you you present something and uh, a, a large decrease of catch potential for uh, for instance for a, a region that is mostly um, uh, dependent on coastal fisheries, right? And for instance, you show in your global models that it can be a large uh, decrease on, on catch uh, potential because of, of of this. And what, what would be a, a policy advice? What can be done uh, in, this, in those cases? For instance, you show that for North, Northeast Brazil, the, um, there will be a, re, a reduction, right? A 40% reduction, for instance, a projection, right? But what would be your policy advice to deal with this? 
because it's something that it's really related to climate or it can be combined uh, things happening there? No, I think um, it's for the tropical areas such as the northern Brazil or like Indo-Pacific uh, with the um, high emission scenarios, that big changes is really uh, worrying because um, there are much, much less opportunities to adapt with that uh, large decrease. So we can do all the safeguard uh, or adaptation measures of good fisheries management, making sure habitat is good and things like that. But the thing is with that large uh, changes in ocean conditions, even though if you do fisheries management well, even though if you protect your habitat, the conditions may change so much that it will drastically transform the existing habitats, making them uh, much less suitable for, for, for fish to live. And so um, they, 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 won't, they won't be um, able to, um, to, uh, to survive there. Many, some species would not be able to survive there. So I think uh, it, some of the more innovative um, solutions and more uh, kind of broad scale solutions may, may need to be implemented. For example, um, for coastal dependent communities, um, we need to think about uh, whether uh, alternative livelihood, um, how they should um, develop uh, like the path, alternative pathway of development for coastal communities. That may be, um, um, uh, that, 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 that may, uh, in, in considerations of those uh, future situations. But, um, I think the overall message that I want to convey is that we really want to try to avoid those situations because um, with their situations, there are really limited options that we can do to deal with those problems. And uh, that's highlighted by the IPCC where the scope for adaptation is really limited with uh, business as usual um, and, um, and, and, and really challenge um, the, um, the defilements of these um, these um, coastal countries, um, and um, particularly a lot of them are developing countries where they, in the next few decades, uh, there are lots of aspirations for continuous development. So with, without um, a good climate mitigations, uh, that really lim uh, affects uh, the trajectory for development. Uh, in, in this sense here in, uh, in, our, in our institute, uh, especially after the UN Oceans uh, Conference uh, that would have in New York, um, we've been doing that people can do things on the individual level, right? There are something that all of us can do at the individual level. So, uh, can you comment on what can people uh, do? And especially uh, if you can mention people like us, uh, citizens, uh, and also uh, Fishing communities. Yeah. Um, so I think the um, uh, at the individual level. Um, so, for example, we can support initiatives that are uh, both support um, supporting mitigations of CO two emission as well as supporting adaptation. So, for mitigations, we can um, at the individual level support our government. Uh, or political parties who is willing to take actions on reducing emission um, and developing, uh, having a more uh, climate-friendly development pathway. And uh, secondly, for adaptations, um, because we know that uh, better management of fish stocks, for example, uh, can actually help uh, marine ecosystem to adapt to some level of climate change. So we can um, engage with more sustainable seafood consumption. Uh, we know there are certain seafood that are from um, unsustainable source. Um, so we can avoid eating that while focusing on eating those uh, that we know are from sustainable source. There are some um, protection, some aquaculture activities that may also be less, uh, uh, more destructive uh, to coastal habitat um, and things like that. We can also avoid that. And then in general, um, some of the basic things such as um, engaging in a low food, lower carbon footprint lifestyle is, uh, is the things that I think individual can do. Okay. Any other comment? No? 
Okay, so just for uh, thank you for for these uh, key messages as a whole. Um, one other issue, because when when you when you show these transboundary problems, especially in um, large pelagic uh, fisheries in in the world, and they are managed by quota quota systems. Uh, let's put an example from the ICAT um, scenario, which is the, the Atlantic Tuna Regional Fisheries Organization, and you're saying that because of these uh, projected changes, that can be new uh, management um, schemes, yeah, uh, and proposals. So my question is, if there is there any uh, a regional fisheries management organization of the world taking this kind of um, data or analysis in quota systems? Or this is nothing happening, it's just, uh, just a, a proposal to, to do so, and how can can be done in, in terms of quota management, if you can have some idea. So, um there are a few international uh, fish stock agreements that consider environmental change in there. That actually provides some, us with some insights of what we can do uh, to adapt to climate change for these international fish stock agreements. Um, for example, um, between US and Canada, um, we shared uh, salmon fish stocks. The salmon actually go from some of the salmon populations go between US and Canada border. And the, shift, the, the, the demand of distribution have, have been shifting or fluctuating in the past. Uh, because of the natural uh, environmental changes uh, in the North Pacific area. In some period of time, there may be small salmon going to Canadian waters, while in other time, there may be more salmon in the U.S. water. And traditionally, it has really led to international deb uh, debate between the two countries. And the fishermen really try to uh, catch all the fish when they can, because they know that um, the fish may be actually moving away from their waters. But then, um, in the last decade or so, um, the two countries signed an agreement, um, particularly uh, arranging a side payment um, mechanism, so that uh, when the country gets more fish, uh, for example, when Canada gets more fish, they can catch more fish, but then they would have to pay for the uh, increase in catch for, uh, for U.S. fishermen. So in this case, uh, the U.S. fishermen would not be losing everything. They will still get compensation or they get additional benefits by the Canadian fishermen uh, catching more fish and vice versa. So this is one way to stabilize a, um, a, a fluctuating or shifting dish, dish fish stocks um, in, the, um, in, 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 um, in this international agreement. Another example is um, in, the, in some part of the South Pacific countries where they also have an international agreement where they have this um, vessel days scheme. So in this case, uh, if tuna, tuna stock has been shifting between countries, EZ. So when uh, the tuna stock move more to one country, one island, the islands can actually buy days of fishing from other countries so that they can actually uh, fish more tunas because of the increase in tuna abundance. While the other countries will not lose completely because now they can get the benefits by selling their days too. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, so, do you want to have some final comments, maybe some concluding remarks, if you want, if Marion would like to have some, some words, or um, we can go for the concluding aspects. And also you, if you want to comment something, just uh, key messages for the, for the talk, and thank you very much. I think that we heard a lot from William about uh, the, the long-term projections and how things uh, might change and what the potential for adaptation of societies to this is, which is very interesting. And uh, I think also that the intermediate uh, future is also important, of course, to be considered and to to think about how to manage the fish stock as it is for today, not really year to year, on a year-to-year -year basis. 
And um, so I'm not a fisheries biologist, but I attended a big workshop co organized by NOAA a couple, like two or three years ago. And I was surprised to hear there that um, many uh, systems that set quota don't take into account the environmental dynamics. And I think this is uh, getting increasingly risky now as the, the fishing effort is increasing and many stocks are fragilized, for more for fragile. So we have to take into account the environmental variability again on different timescales in this uh, fish stock assessment. And that's one thing. And the other thing is that we heard about coastal communities and it is very key to work with those coastal communities as Marie, you do here already and William, you do also uh, in Canada. I think that a coastal community in, in Canada, if it is a First Nation uh, or whether it is a coastal community on the Canadian East Coast dominated by immigrants, or a coastal community in France, which is probably much closer to the coastal community uh, in Canada, dominated by immigrants, or coastal community town here, is, is a really different uh, settings onto, from the anthropological point of view, despite they might face common, common dangers or common challenges. So I think it's very important to work locally with the people and to understand their their needs, their expectations, and also their particular, how their culture links into an, the environment. And I, I see that there, there is more and more groups doing this, and I think this is a re really important thing to develop in the future. Yeah, thank you. You have to come something? I think... Um, tech, going back to the, kind of the, um, the overarching questions that... Um, Mary said at the beginnings of how these global models tell us. Um, and I think it tells us about these broad trends, uh, broad scale impacts, and highlights the issues of that would uh, challenge our global society. But then I think, uh, as Marilyn highlighted, um, the next step is then to link these global trends to um, regions uh, and local communities and how that would then affect their peoples in there, and also how these responses, um, how they, 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 uh, at the local scale can respond to these changes, and how that then uh, feedback into these border scale changes, because ultimately, um, global scale actions actually rely on local scale actions. It is a collection of local scale actions that become global scale actions. Um, so having that feedback of different scale or multi-scale feedback um, is, poses a main, main challenge um, to kind of researchers like Marion and I at the, both the natural science side and as well as Mary at the natural science side and the social science side, um, and how to bring that linkages both between different scale of the, uh, from global to local, as well as between discipline from natural science, from the oceanography to biology and to social science. And I think um, we are actually, we know um, quite a lot of how to engage with that. And I think um, in, um, uh, we hope that uh, by um, undertaking this uh, research, uh, we will generate um, uh, the, uh, the necessary knowledge to continue to support um, actions and policies that allow us to tackle these global scale challenges. Because ultimately, I think um, there are, uh, in, in the long term, um, two essential uh, conditions uh, for um, continuous uh, sustainable development. Uh, the first one is uh, improving governance. So I think governance is important. If, if you have, without good governance, I think it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to implement um, actions. And secondly, it's good science and good knowledge to support policy that would then inform what the governance um, actions should be uh, and how people should respond. So I think um, um, these are the two kind of things I think that all of us, uh, the three of us and other colleagues in here are actually working towards too. Thank you very much. So maybe next project, because in this project we had the, this title, the, which is GAUS, which is Global Understanding for Local Solutions, but maybe you also need an, a, another uh, second step, um, saying local, local understanding uh, for global solutions as well. <laughs> yeah, so we need both. <laughs> and um, 
also I think that we can uh, close. I really appreciate it. Thank you once again. Thank you very much for Marion and William to come here to the University of Sao Paulo. I, I know uh, that they made a tremendous effort <laughs> to do so. Uh, so again, thank you very much. And thank you all for listening to us. And also I want to acknowledge the um, French Argentinian Institute for the Climate and its Impact in Argentina. So thank you, Claudia, if you are listening to us, and Barbara uh, for the support in terms of the, the tickets. And also the Voces project um, from Alberto Piola from the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research that also contributed to this uh, travel of, of them to, to South America and including this Sao Paulo visit. And again, thank you for the Institute of Advanced Studies. And I hope to see you in the next uh, seminar of this series that we will more focus on fishing communities, but we, we will also have some local uh, examples and local results. So this global uh, overview will be really remind uh, the next seminar as well. Okay, thank you very much.